Hello, and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller, and my guest is historian Norman Housley. His book, Fighting for the Cross, looks at the everyday realities of the medieval crusades, from what prompted ordinary people to depart for the Holy Land to fight for the cross in the first place, to what they ate and how they travelled. I asked Norman what had provided the impetus for the First Crusade at the end of the 11th century. The main thing that's happening is a, a, a tremendous sense of spiritual anxiety uh, amongst the European population, concern about um, about what's going to happen to people after they die, because they're, the sins that they've committed inevitably, in most cases in the course of their lives, conjoined with a growing sense of concern about the condition of the holy places, uh, about the Turkish occupation of Jerusalem, and the, um, and the feeling of pollution that uh, European Catholics uh, felt in connection with Christ's tomb and the significance of, uh, of that tomb for the whole of Christianity. So it's, it's important perhaps to understand from the start then that crusades are not simply a military adventure or a, a spiritual adventure with a military end. They, they've also got what you refer to in the book as um, a, a penitential purpose. Yeah. I think the best working definition of crusade is that of penitential warfare, taking the specific uh, form of an armed pilgrimage um, to, to the Holy Land. So it is, a, it is a synergy. It's preached in 1095 in the first instance and throughout the course of the crusading movement as, as a synergy or a synthesis of, um, of devotion, um, of penitential devotion with military objectives which are, which are clearly defined. We would be mistaken, would we, in thinking that going on a crusade in order to raid and come back with plunder, which is a, a popular belief, I think, that, that, that would be a misconception to see that as a possible motivation for going crusading. I think given the numbers of people who took the cross between 1095 and the end of the 13th century, given the, th the fact that thousands of people responded to the call for, for, to crusade, you could probably say that there wasn't a single motivation which wasn't there in at least some cases. And obviously some of the common chroniclers and some of the commentators, if they were of a sceptical frame of mind, would say that people are going out of vanity or out of curiosity or whatever. So the first thing to say is that there was an infinity, an, you know, an endless diversity of motivational response. The second thing is that while some people obviously did stay in the East and maybe were pulled there in the first place by the attraction of land, most people came back. And in fact, the biggest, one of the biggest problems that the Holy Land faced was that people weren't staying there at the, after the completion of the crusade. So I think one has to deduce from that, as well as from the, you know, the overwhelmingly religious tone of the bulk of the evidence, that, that most people who went saw themselves from the beginning as pilgrims albeit armed pilgrims, in other words, that from the start they intended to come back. And the sorts of safeguards and the sorts of security measures which they tried to put into place in terms of their lands and families would point in the same direction. It is an exercise which is dictated primarily by, by a religious impulse, and once that impulse has been satisfied, they would come back to their normal lives in the West. Going back up to the top level, at the, the level of the papal decision to proclaim a crusade, you said something very interesting in the book. You say a proclaiming a declaring a crusade mm. is a bit like opening a Pandora's yeah. box. Yes, one can point to several groups in society which present present issues or problems which are going to arise from crusade preaching. In, in the first place, um, something which is often overlooked, it was very dangerous for the church itself because it's proclaiming uh, a campaign which it, 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 is, it is declaring to be um, willed by God, as the famous cry has it which went up at Clermont, Deus le volt, God wants this. Now, if the church is, uh, is saying that's the case, and the military expedition then fails and some of them failed cataclysmically with huge loss of life and great suffering, then there's bound to be a backlash. And that backlash would have to be directed or would likely be directed against the people who pre preached and, uh, the crusade and exhorted people to go in the first place. So the first group, which is likely to suffer and knows it's likely to suffer after the debates, after the defeat started to pile up, was the medieval church. So in a sense, it's misguided to say that the church 
for the church it's a great weapon it's a, it is indeed a it is indeed a sign of the church's influence but that, that influence is is very double-edged in terms of the uh, the consequences which it could have a second group which is uh, which is in which is uh, uh, placed in peril and this is true from the first crusade right through the whole of the movement is medieval jews because uh, there was an inevitable tendency to focus your mind if you were a crusader on the suffering of christ on the cross and that led people to think about the circumstances of his crucifixion and to direct their energies and their violence against jewish communities um, within europe your book very successfully brings out what a major logistical operation mounting a crusade was. And it's, it's, it's very easy to overlook the fact that mm. there was no blueprint for the First Crusade mm. and moving thousands of people east with all sorts of mixed motives and, yeah. <laughs> and mixed yeah. um, resources was, was, a, was a huge undertaking and, and, and no sort of military command structure. Yeah, absolutely. I, th- I, I think it's, it's probably true that the First Crusade was the biggest military undertaking that Europe had, had engaged in since the fall of the Roman Empire, and that it happened at a time when obviously it, w- it was possible, or the groups couldn't have got together at all and made their way to the east. But the sheer sort of strain and the sheer tension, the sheer challenge, as one historian of crusading has put it, that crusading posed in terms of assembly, in terms of provisioning, in terms of movement, in terms of direction and last but not least in terms of control, making sure that they didn't simply disappear as the, en route, um, was really formidable. And that's two of the First Crusade. And you can see that as you move through the Second and Third Crusades into the late 12th century, increasingly leaders are beginning to appreciate what is involved and are beginning to take measures to to try to exert control and to make the whole business more efficient because uh, as military disasters accumulated there was obviously the need not just to sort of uh, make the crusades get there but also to make the make them get to the eastern mediterranean in a condition in which they could do the military job they'd set out to do and very simple things like finding enough water and enough food to feed people were, were major challenges. How, how, how much do we know about those kind of aspects of crusading, those practical fulfilment of, um, of bodily needs? Well, we know more than we did, um, I'm glad to say. I mean, it's one of the areas of crusading studies which has become more and more investigated in the past 10, 20 years. It used to be almost totally neglected. But the sorts of questions which are thrown up by moving thousands of people hundreds of miles to unfamiliar terrains, unfamiliar climates, those questions are, and issues are, in, are, are enormous. We know that contemporaries found them very, very difficult to deal with. Questions about about sustenance, about how much food would have been needed, about the food that the, um, the, the horses would have acquired, particularly in terms of sea travel, actually. This is one of the areas which has become very, very lively of late. How do you actually sort of find the food and above all the water that's required for the troops as they were, as they were on ships making their way across the Mediterranean? 